Right, hello, good evening. Welcome everyone to another introduction to astronomy, once again online for October. Um, so let's get going. So it's the year's 2021. It's 50 years this year since Mariner 9, when a NASA spacecraft first sent us this grainy image from Mars in 1971. And incidentally, Mariner 9 was the first spacecraft for any space agency to go into orbit of any planet, of course, except for Earth. So it was the first uh, interplanetary orbital mission. Um, and it was 50 years ago, so I thought it's a nice time to uh, talk a little bit about it and talk a little bit about Mars. And from this grainy picture, they saw a very interesting feature. Um, suggestive of flowing water or where water or some sort of fluid had previously flown. So that, that's interesting. Let's, let's delve into that a little bit deeper. But of course, since, since then, we've sent rovers and landers up to Mars, and the images that are all coming back show that Mars, as shown here, is a very dry and barren place. The surface does not look like it's conducive for water flowing through it at any time soon. But when you look at some of the images, you actually see, you think, oh, those images look very similar to what you see on places on Earth, like dry lake and riverbeds. That's a picture of Mars. So there's a problem there. What, it, you know, it's, it's looks like there's some features of liquid water, but you, but mostly it's cold and barren. The reason there's a problem is that Mars atmosphere is very cold. Its average temperature is minus 60 degrees Celsius, almost as cold as my daughter's student flat in Dunedin in the middle of winter. The atmosphere is also very thin. It's less than 1% of the thinness or thickness, if you will, of Earth's atmosphere. So it's very, very thin, very, very cold. You need, for liquid water to be on the surface, you need an atmosphere that's warm to stop it from freezing out, and you need atmospheric pressure to stop it just evaporating away. So there's very much a problem going on here. And so the problems and questions that all this raises is Mars's current cold, dry, and thin atmosphere is not suitable at all for surface liquid water. So it begs the question, was there surface liquid water there in the past, as some of the features suggest? And if so, what changed? When did it change? And why did it change? And that's why tonight's talk is entitled Liquid Water on Mars, a story of climate and change. And the aim will be to show you tonight what Mars was once like, when it changed, how it changed, and why it changed. And I've tried putting some nice pictures in here for you as well to enjoy. So we've broken it down into five chapters. Just going to talk briefly on current conditions on Mars, what it looks like now in terms of looking for water, uh, what we can see. I'm um, just going to talk briefly on some prominent, relevant geological features that are relevant to our discussion this evening. Uh, I'm going to talk, then I'm going to show you the evidence, some real good, hard, key evidence for past surface liquid water having been on Mars. We'll then talk about Mars's early atmosphere and how its climate has clearly changed over time. And then we'll wrap up with a summary and a conclusion. So let's get going. So the current condition on Mars. Yeah, the current conditions and the questions that have been debated, we'll just review those. I'm going to show you where there's very clearly where there's surface ice on Mars, water ice, and where there's subsurface water ice on Mars. So as I've mentioned, yeah, Mars is a dry, cold place with a thin atmosphere. The questions debated is what was the state of past water? If we're seeing all these signs, was it liquid water flowing? Was it solid water? Was it ice flowing along, causing changes on the on the surface? You know, signs of erosions and stuff. Was the water above the ground or was it below the ground and the ground's been moved on? Once we've sort of been answering all those questions too, one of the key questions is, which I'm going to address now, is where is the water now 
What can we see up there in the way of water? And then, of course, what was the climate like to support water in the past? And then, as we've talked about, why, how and when did the climate change? So that's really the, the main questions that are debated at the moment. So let's move on. Where is this surface water? Can you see surface water on Mars at the moment? You can in the form of ice, predominantly at the poles. And I've got my little Mars um, globe here, which I'll show you briefly. So both the North Pole and the South Pole both have uh, the, the polar caps, they call them, both have ice. There's a, a lot, lot more at the northern polar cap, as you can see, and a lot less at the southern polar cap. Um, so let's go through that. So it's water and it's carbon dioxide ice at the poles. It's predominantly water ice, and there's a layer of carbon dioxide ice that in the warmer summer months for the respective pole sublimes or evaporates straight off into the atmosphere while that core water ice remains as such all year round. As mentioned, the North Polar Ice Cap is the largest between the northern and the southern. Um, that large cap is about a thousand kilometres across. Putting that in perspective, that's the length of the North Island. That's from Cape Reinga down to Wellington, it's about a roughly about a thousand kilometres. So that's how wide that cap of the water base, water ice base on the, the northern polar cap. That's huge. Uh, radar shows it's about two, two kilometres deep. Um, out of the cap, when it's at its largest, obviously in winter, uh, when the CO2 has frozen in there as well, still 90% of it is water. Then moving down to the solar, the south polar cap, which is, yep, it's a lot smaller, but it's a lot deeper than the North Pole cap. Um, its water base is only 420 kilometres across, but it's 3.7 kilometres deep. So that's fairly a decent sort of, you know, chunk of ice sitting at both poles. Now, there are some other places where you can get some surface ice water, and that is around the polar caps, and particularly the northern polar cap, there are some large craters there which are full of ice. And one of them called Korolev is the biggest one. It's actually so large, you can actually see it if you've got one of these um, Mars globes at home. Go up to the north polar cap and look down there, there's a few little craters, and Korolev is actually large enough to be represented on the globe. So it is a significant feature. It's fairly high up, latitude 78 um, degrees north. It's 82 centimetres, sorry, it's kilometres across. So that's a decent sized crater. Uh, it's got a central permanent mould of water ice, 60 by 1.8 kilometres um, of water ice, which gives it 2,200 cubic kilometres of water ice. That is 37 times the volume of Lake Taupo, New Zealand's largest lake. And this one crater, Korolev crater, close to the northern polar cap, is just covered in water ice with 70, uh, sorry, 37 times the volume of Lake Taupo. So it's, there's, there is significant amount of water ice up there, and that's fully exposed to the atmosphere. Okay, moving down a little bit more, down to uh, 68 degrees north here, latitude. Um, they have found some subsurface water ice. So up to now, the polar caps and the uh, those craters just a little bit lower down, they have been surface ice. There is some subsurface ice just below the surface. And that was discovered in 2008 by NASA's Phoenix lander. And they had a robot, a digging sort of arm style robot, as you can see. This is a, an artist impression of the Phoenix lander. And here's its little sort of robotic digger here that it dug into the soil. And lo and behold, it exposed some water ice just below the surface. You're talking, what, centimetres below the surface there. And that ice slowly sublimed in front of everyone over about four days. Moving on, 2017 and moving down in latitude from 68 down to about 55 to 58 degrees latitude, um, they did, managed to discover 100 metre thick ice sheets under about one to two metres of soil at the exposed uh, eroded cliff edges of some recent craters. And you can see here, so he, here's your uh, cliff edge of a crater. There's about one or two metres of soil and sort of it's, they've colourised it in for us to see in that blue. So that's sheets 
of uh, water ice about 100 meters thick below there. So that's down to 55 to 58 degrees latitude. So that's further getting down. They did some calculations of that and, um, uh, and uh, just advanced it further with their computer models. And they worked out if this is, if we're seeing this now, we estimate that about a third of the Martian surface, just below the surface, there's a lot of ground ice sitting in there. That's yeah, that's underneath about a third of the Martian surface. Very interesting. Now, then you're going down further. Just two years ago, radar was able to detect down at 39 degrees latitude, so much further away again from the poles, there was numerous sheets of large subsurface deposits of water ice exposed in these, once again, younger, fresh craters. Once again, they've colorized it all in blue for us for us to see. Um, so, yeah, so, the, you know, it, it, it's there, all right. There is, there is, you know, reasonable amounts of water still sitting up there, uh, accessible to, uh, to, to Mars. And, of course, this is going to be of great interest, not only to astrobiologists looking for signs of past life, but also future inhabitants uh, when we go to Mars to live. Where are you going to put your Mars station? Where are you going to live? Where the water is, A, to drink and cook, but B, to use as fuel for your rockets. So, so that's uh, talking about some subglacial ice. Also, they've detected recently, underneath the South Polar Cap, there's about four sub glacial, underneath the glaciers of the solar pack, uh, of the uh, solar caps, large lakes. The largest is about 20 kilometres across. It's about, how deep are they? About one and a half kilometres below the glaciers, you've got these sort of uh, liquid water lakes. So that was a real coup to see those. And you might say, well, we've been talking so far about ice because it's pretty cold. I understand that. How are you getting this liquid water there? If you know water freezes, hello, at zero degrees. Um, so what's going on there? And the general thinking is there's two factors that's, that's enabling those lakes of liquid water to exist. One is there's a lot of magnesium and calcium perchlorate salts in the, on the Martian soil. And essentially they are salts and they act as antifreeze. So they lower the temperature at, at which uh, which water freezes over. So in other words, if you can get it below that that temperature, that antifreeze factor below the, the below the um, the temperature of at which the water is being kept, then it won't freeze. And they also suggest there's most likely a heat source down there, probably a chamber of some molten rock giving warmth to the lakes as well. So there's probably two factors in there um, that are allowing these subsurface or subglacial, if you will, um, large um, lakes of, of liquid water. So that's most interesting. So the conclusion, what is the current water status on Mars? There's abundant water ice, as, as we looked at, the north and the south solar, um, uh, polar, polar caps. Um, there's subsurface ice just underneath the surface, large amounts, and up to a third of the planet. Uh, and as we've talked about, there's um, at the, other, in the southern solar caps underneath there, underneath the glaciers, there's some liquid brine lakes. So that's the current sort of uh, status to the best of our knowledge. So let's just briefly go over some prominent geological features that are relevant to this discussion. And what I've done here, this is a topographical uh, diagram of the surface of Mars. Um, the red colors representing high altitudes and then through to yellow, green, and then going to deeper tones of blue for lower and lower um, altitudes. And Mars is quite nicely split into three regions, if you will. Um, and starting at the um, at the bottom bit here, you've got what they call the Southern Highlands. So let's get our little globe out again. So this a large proportion of the southern part of the of the planet is called the Southern Highlands. And the, and the reason they call it the Highlands is there's an obvious thing going on with Mars with the crust. There's what they call the crustal dichotomy, whereby the southern hemisphere, the crust is a lot thicker, 38 kilometers thick, versus or contrast to the northern um, hemisphere, whereby the crust is a lot lower down, it's 32 kilometers thick, and they call it the northern lowlands. Now, 
Um, they don't know the reason for that. It's speculated probably in the early days in its formation, a collision or something like that. But it's there. There's a crustal dichotomy. So the southern hemisphere is the, what they call the highlands. It's heavily cratered. And from there, they infer that the surface of, that, of the highlands is somewhere between 4.1 and 3.7 billion years old. And you might say, how do they know that? They use a method, a, a, a dating method involving counting craters. And an older a surface is, the uh, it's got more craters, it's got in particular more larger craters, and the craters are more densely packed. So it's analysis of counter, cr counting numbers of craters, the size of the craters, and uh, how dense they are. And it's because of there was a period uh, about four billion years ago when the outer planets were moving around a lot of it, and they but that um, caused a huge bombardment of asteroids and smaller rocks into the inner planets, and they got bombarded. But, um, so it's called the heavy or the late stage um, bombardment um, period. So it makes sense that an older surface carries the scars of that large rocks and asteroids smashing into the planet. So there's lots of large craters, just lots of craters, in particular large craters. And you might say, well, how do they correlate that with the actual age of the surface? It all comes down to the Apollo astronauts who brought the moon rocks back they, um, and they uh, radioactive date, date, we're able to radio um, date the rocks to determine how old the rocks were and then of course correlate it with the region in which the astronauts got the rocks. So that's how they've formed, they've sort of created this formula. So you've got your highly cratered southern highlands, uh, about 4.1 to 3.7 billion years old. Then you've got your sort of your central or equatorial regions. As you can see here, there's a lot of volcanoes and thing going, things going on here. Some, some volcanoes here. This is Olympus Mons, the largest volcano in the solar system. Uh, it's 22 kilometers high, which is three times the height of Mount Everest. This here called the Tharsis Bulge, it takes up about 25% of the surface of Mars. And it's a, just one big volcanic plateau that's just lifted up. Um, the Arabia Terra region, there's a lot of sort of depression areas in here they thought initially were craters, but current evidence is suggesting that, that those depressions are actually um, calderas or openings, if you will, of past very extremely powerful volcanoes. So this whole region around sort of the central equatorial regions, there's a lot of volcanoes, the volcanic plateaus and these calderas, um, suggesting there's been a lot of volcanic activity going on there. And of course, the lava flows out of there covers a lot of the older surface up and creates a new surface. And with the equator counting, they estimate that the surface of this equatorial central region is somewhere between 3.7 and 2.8 billion years old. So typo there, that should read uh, 2.8, pardon me. Forgot the little dot. Um, and then there's the uh, northern lowlands up here, as we discussed earlier on. It's the sort of, it's a very um, low, the crust is very thin. And it's, why is the surface so smooth? There's very few craters here. A lot of lava has flowed over that surface over the years. And that's the youngest surface on Mars. It's about 2.8 billion years old. And it's very smooth there as well. So that just gives you uh, the three prominent geological regions of Mars and how it provides clues as we'll go forth. You'll see the relevant of all and trying to time past events and climate changes. So let's move on to section three, the evidence for past surface liquid water. And it's really there's two main lines of evidence, um, namely the geomorphic features, in other words, sort of how uh, how the landscape looks and that, that's taken from observations from the orbiters around Mars. And the spectroscopic uh, features, in other words, examining the rocks and the minerals from the ground, namely with rovers and stuff, looking at them through spectroscopes and determining more about what sort of minerals are in the rocks and also just what they can see in terms of uh, features with the rocks in that as well. So let's go and have a look. So starting up with the geomorphic features, really with observations from orbit, and there's four main things I want to talk about here. Valley networks, outflow channels, lakes and deltas, and in the Mars ocean hypothesis. So let's talk about valley networks. And what valley networks are, as you can see them here, large systems of just channels, 
obviously that suspected carried some sort of liquid or looks highly suspicious for that, branching out and out and out. Um, very prominent in those southern highlands. What does that tell you? That they're mostly over 3.7 billion years old. Whatever caused or was flowing through there was over 3.7 billion years for them to be in the southern highlands. To a lesser extent, you can start, you can see a few in the central equatorial region surfaces, which we know was 3.7 to 2.8 billion years old. And then it seems to peter out. You do not see any signs of these valley networks um, within, you know, for example, in the, the um, northern lowlands where this young surface is is, um, is no older than 2.5, 2.8 billion years old. Um, typically, the width of these valley networks, usually between one to nine kilometres um, length, they can go for hundreds of kilometres. So they go for long distances, yeah, and anything up to about 10 kilometres wide. So you've got to ask yourself, Okay, so we're seeing these things here. What sort of climate conditions would have caused these, these sort of branches of channels going through the um, sort of the highlands of the old highlands of Mars? And there's sort of four possible um, climate scenarios. One is, was Mars at the time warm and wet? In other words, did it have rainfall? And with a lot of surface runoff and erosion of the rocks and that underneath it, Quite possibly, that's a, that's a very likely explanation. Or was the climate warm and dry? Uh, in other words, there was liquid water there flowing all right, but there was no rain. The water got came up to the surface from geothermally heated spring waters rising to the surface and then flowing along the surface versus coming down in rain. Was the climate cold and wet? In other words, there was if the climate was wet, sure, there's things coming down, but what was coming down, it wasn't rain, it was snowfall, which then formed glaciers, and the glaciers moved across the rocks, eroding the surface and creating these features we now see. Or was it just simply cold and dry? In other words, just sort of water was just sort of, there was sheets of ice, ice caps and so on, glaciers, and it was just sort of meltwater, sort of channels of, of liquid water just underneath those, just gliding along, creating the erosion. And it appears to be the most favoured hypothesis is the warm and wet climate. Um, it explains a lot more, for example, the more high resolution pictures that with sort of more advanced pictures with more advanced orbiters and cameras and so on, they could make out a lot more detail. And you could see here the branching was what they call higher ordering. In other words, to set up, set up a low order might say one branch breaking into two branches, breaking into four. High order refers to just breaking into four, breaking into eight, breaking into 16, 32, 64, and so on, so on. More and more branches coming off each other. And that's what they could see. They could see terracing, some structure to the side of them, um, exposed bedrock. And really the most likely cause of that, rainfall with surface runoff and then erosion of the rocks. So that's the most likely climate at the time. And remember, we're going back pre 3.7 billion years. Most likely there was rainfall on Mars. The next thing is, yeah, outflow channels. Outflow channels Obviously, channels you see that water or liquid, uh, some sort of liquid, which we're assuming is water, has flowed across the surface of Mars. But these are much longer, wider, and much deeper, much a different scale totally than your valley networks. Um, and typically, the, this is the um, the half, and I've got a slide shortly show you the full size of this, the, the, uh, the KC Valley. This is just half of it. That's three and a half thousand kilometers long. Um, so that's actually about, I think about twice the distance of New Zealand, um, 400 kilometres wide and 2.5 kilometres deep. And you see all these little streamline, these little islands here. Um, so what it's consistent with, with the modelling and what you see on Earth and stuff, um, it's all consistent when you get a, just a sudden release of just large volumes of water. So instead of just water trickling down or just flowing just quietly and gently like you'll see with a stream or river, you've had something that's been dry and all of a sudden, like a flash flood, just large volumes of water at great velocity, just rocketing down through an area. And that's what would create these outflow channels. So where do they originate from? They appear to originate from sort of depressions, little dips or, or craters. Um, and then the water appears to have led out from there suddenly and created these streamlined islands, as I've mentioned. 
So let's show you that here's the diagram. So we were just looking at this region here, but here it is here. That is three and a half thousand kilometers long. So obviously there's a lot of water just gushing and gushing and gushing through from this. Yeah, and that's twice the length of New Zealand. New Zealand's about 1600 kilometers long. So I don't know if that's saying something about the outflow channels or whether it's saying something about New Zealand, um, but I like living in a small country. So let's move on and the next slide here. Yeah, so I said they come from depression. So how did all this come about? And the general consensus is that, first of all, let's just move over to this little comment that I've made here. They're observed on surfaces 3.3 to 3 billion years old. In other words, surfaces that are a lot younger than those valley networks. And we know that Mars, you're probably getting the gist of the talk, is getting colder and colder because um, I've just argued that it was most likely a warm, a wet. We know it's cold. So you're getting the gist of it here. So it's on these sort of, you tend to find these on the surfaces more in the central equatorial regions. Um, so there, there are more, more recent than your valley networks. So they, the general consensus and, and uh, theory goes that by then, a lot of that surface water was starting to go underground and building up underground because all the surface water was starting to freeze or evaporate, which we'll talk more about. And they formed into these really deep underground reservoirs under high pressure of water. And the pressure may well have just risen as more and more water gets in there. Uh, you've got the earth coming down, the weight of the earth coming down on these large reservoirs. Then all it takes is something like a tectonic force, a bit of movement of the ground. They've got volcanic activity going on. An asteroid impact might trigger it. But it, a trigger happens where suddenly the surface blows off and all this water is just suddenly under high pressure, just goes wham and just gets suddenly released. So you get this huge outburst of surface liquid water, which flows down and causes all this flooding and hence your outflow channels. So that's most likely the general consensus is how they form and why you see them and why you see them on those surfaces. So you can see now the advantages of us talking about um, the different regions of Mars, the different time zones and how they know the different time periods. Um, OK, so we've talked about valley networks. We've talked about these large outflow uh, channels. Now, I mentioned lakes and deltas in there. And certainly a lot of the large craters once again, what are large craters from? Older surfaces. Where do you get the older surfaces? In the southern highlands. So in the southern highland regions, we get these large craters. And some of the features are very, very suggestive that these large craters also were ancient lakes. And this is um, Holden Crater here. You can see that's where it's situated here. Um, that is uh, over 160 kilometres across. Um, and I've put here to show you an idea of the size of it. Here's Lake Taupo, New Zealand's largest lake, 46 kilometres across. Um, and you can see it fitting in there. You could fit about at least th three and a bit Lake Taupos on edge on the long way choo, 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 to get across uh, Holden Crater. So it was a decent sized lake in its day, assuming an evidence point to say that it was. Notice sort of this little channel here, and it cuts through the rim of the crater. That would have been a lovely source of water going in or water going out. Notice how the, uh, the surface of the crater looks very flat. What do we know that looks flat? Sedimentary rock, you know, the bases of rivers and lakes. Um, you, you know, if you dra drain a big lake bed, what does it look like? It looks flat. Um, then you get these alluvial um, fans, also known as deltas, whereby, and that's where sediment gets flowed down by the river, and it enters into a body of still water, and you get all the sediment flows out into a fan, called alluvial fan, or sometimes known as a delta. And so you can see here, you get channels going in, possibly going out of the, off the um, crater rim. You've got the sedimentary, it looks like sedimentary base to it here. And you've got these alluvial fans here. That is highly suggestive that that large crater was once a large lake. And it would fit if there was rainfall in those southern highlands over 3.7 billion years ago. <clears throat> okay. Now, um, so I just put this in here because we talked more about deltas as well, and that's the deposition of sediment, as I mentioned. This is a, cr a crater called um, uh, e Everswald Crater, and look at the size. This is just part of the crater, but look at the size. 
of the delta. That there is 115 square kilometers. And that's just sediment that's been carried by something. Once again, it's a no-brainer. What's done that? It's liquid, most likely water. What is the most common water in the solar system in the universe? Um, it's it's water. And you've just got here, must be liquid water just flowing in here, bringing sediment that settled in to some standing water or lake to create this lovely big delta in which you see these on Earth quite happily. Now, the fourth thing I mentioned was the proposed Mars ocean hypothesis. And there's a very strong hypothesis, line of thought, suggesting that the top part, those northern lowlands that you saw early on that topographical map, was just one big ocean on Mars, that a third of the surface of Mars was covered in this big northern lowlands ocean. And, uh, and I'll actually talk about the supporting observations in a minute, but that water would have served a very, um, it would explain a lot. It would have served as a large water reservoir for the rain. If you're going to have rain, if you're going to have snow, you, you've essentially got to have some sort of hydrological cycle set up uh, where water can get evaporated, then come back down again for rain or snow. So that would have quite nicely provided that reservoir for that. You might say, well, OK, I can imagine a, a, an ocean in there. Please give me some, you know, some supporting evidence. Absolutely. And they've got the proposed shoreline where they think the ocean probably went. And it's quite a complex shoreline. And if, you, if they go along and study all the, the geomorphological features along here, yep, they see a lot of valley networks draining in from the highlands, coming down from the highlands, draining into the shoreline. And they also see a lot of delta deposits of sedimentary uh, material all being laid around here, the shoreline as well. So there's a lot of strong evidence. There was a large body of still water, namely an ocean, sitting up here with strong evidence for it along the proposed shoreline. And that, once again, would tie in quite nicely with that hydrological cycle of water being evaporated up and then coming back down again. Um, and another strong supporting of evidence is studying the ratio of heavy water with normal light water. Let me explain. As we know that water is H2O, hydrogen and oxygen, and we always think of water as sort of the standard light water where you get two, um, two hydrogens and the oxygen, and each hydrogen is just one protein. But hydrogen has an isotope. Uh, with, a, with a neutron in it called deuterium. So naturally it's got an extra particle, so it's a bit heavier. So you can get heavy water, whereby you, instead of just two standard hydrogens and an oxygen, you get a standard hydrogen, a deuterium, which has an extra neutron in it, and, and your oxygen. So it makes sense that he water here is a little bit heavier. And there's a standard ratio that they allow that most the theory fits quite nicely. You should get a right proportion of light versus heavy water, uh, a, light, uh, there's a ratio. And there's just uh, an uncountable for a, a larger proportion of heavy water to light water ratio than you would normally expect with the theory. And the general consensus is we're going to be leading to is that obviously Mars has lost some water, some light water, whether it's gone up to the atmosphere or it's gone down, which we're going to going on talking about. But it's certainly highly suggestive that on Mars, the water volumes, liquid water volumes on Mars in the past is significantly higher than the water that we can see today. So, so that's been looking at the geomorphic evidence, sort of a lot of the evidence on the big scale features from orbiters and so on. How about the observations on rocks and minerals and stuff uh, <clears throat> from the ground? In other words, with rovers and so on. And I've, so I'm going to talk about three landing sites here, and then we're going to talk briefly about um, meteorites that come from Mars. So here is Gus of Crater. This is where um, Spirit, the um, rover, uh, NASA's rover Spirit, landed here in Gus of Crater. Um, opportunity, I landed over here in a region called Meridiana Planum. Um, and then Curiosity is over here, landing in a place called Gale Crater. So notice they're all along sort of the equatorial regions as well. So let's go and have a look and see what observations they made for the ground. So Gus of Crater, it's got a diameter, once again, it's very similar size to Holden Crater, very large. Here's your 
Lake Taupo that I've put here in, in comparison to it. So it's large. And it was chosen to go there, for, for spirit to go there, for its appearances. And I think you already know this, what we've talked about. Doesn't that look like an ancient lake bed, doesn't it? Here's the look, you know, there's all sorts of little channel systems, but look at this big, huge, big channel system leading in here. Look at the alluvial fan or your delta fan around here as well. Sediments flowed in here and then settled in this sort of large body of standing water. So it just quietly settles. Look at the flat base here. So that's highly likely, very possibly a sedimentary base. So that's got a lot of features. Let's send spirit rover down there and have a closer inspection. So what are some of the results? What did it see? When it analysed uh, the soil and the exposed rocks and stuff, they found a lot of sulphates, geoethite and carbonates, and those are minerals that only form in the presence of water. It's the only way they can form. Also, there was a lack of olivine. Um, olivine is a mineral, not an uncommon mineral, and it decomposes in the presence of water. And surprisingly, there was no olivine anywhere. So I thought, oh, hello, that infers, once again, there's been water here. There was a lot of uh, silica-rich soil, um, and typically on Earth, you tend to get a lot of that where you get geothermal hot spring environments. So that infers quite possibly around Gus of Crater, there was some warm springs water coming up that had been heated from below and coming up. So the general conclusion was that Gus of Crater was a shallow lake. How old? Somewhere between 4.1 and 3.7 billion years ago. So Meridiani Planum, that's where Opportunity landed here. This is a view across the plane, and you can see the discarded parachute and the um, back shell from the, uh, from the device which they landed in, so you can see that across the plane. I thought that was quite a cool picture. So what are the results of the observations? They found numerous what they call spherical blueberries on the surface around this region. Um, and they're composed of a hematite. And hematite is an iron oxide mineral, very typical of what you get when you get hot water springs and standing water. So that would suggest, yep, once again, there's some hot springs going on here and some water just lying around. They also, as you can see here, these veins of gypsum running through some sedimentary rock. So here's your sedimentary rock once again, that's brought with water carries in and brings sedimentary rock in. So you can see these veins of gypsum. Gypsum is a sulfate mineral, once again, that forms in water. And the fact that you're getting these veins running through the sedimentary rock, that is highly suggestive that was once underground flowing water, water flowing underneath the ground. They also found a lot of these holes in the rocks, also known as bugs, B-U-Gs, bugs, or holes in the ground. And sort of little, sort of, it almost looks like they've been eaten by worms and that, doesn't it? So there's little channels, little microscopic channels and holes in the rocks here. And the most likely explanation for those is that there's probably some sulfate mineral. Once again, sulfate needs water to form. Sulfate mineral formed in the rocks and then was dissolved, later dissolved and removed by water. That's the most likely explanation for that. Just on a more sort of stepping back at, at, a, at a larger scale, they could see there's lots of the sort of where these get these um, outcroppings of rocks, where they get lamination of rocks, get cross bedding going on here and in, in different uh, and 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 uh, here is like some is going in different orientations and stuff. You see that on Earth. Where do you see it? Where there's flowing water, just gently flowing water, not big rushing floods, but not still water, just where you get nice flowing water. That's where you see that. And once again, that was seen in the Meridiani Planum region. Gale Crater, where Curiosity landed, um, that's its landing site here. So Gale Crater, now once again, another big old crater, 154 kilometers across. Uh, Mount Sharp was the big mountain in the middle of it all. 5.5 kilometers high. They think the whole complex is somewhere between three and a half to 3.8 billion years old. The site was chosen, Gale Crater was chosen for a lot of, in, you can see here, there's just channels everywhere. There's a lot of um, ingoing channels into the, uh, into the large crater, a lot of alluvial fans going on. It's not the greatest of detail here, but you probably may well have seen, otherwise go and look on the internet later tonight, the uh, Gale, um, Gale Crater landing site for Curiosity. Lots of alluvial fans going on. 
Um, and the other great thing about here, Mount Sharp is considered to be most likely, it's just multi, multiple layers of sedimentary rocks that have just built up in the crater over millions of years. Then the outsides of it have been eroded away to create this mountain. So it makes sense looking closely at this mountain is, is giving you exposure to millions of years of geological process, probably different climates and so on, and different atmospheric conditions. So um, you can see this is just a, a gold mine for geological exploration. So what are some of the results? Um, yes, they could see evidence of multiple uh, sort of those alluvial related deposits of sedimentary material. Um, they found these are actually pictures from Earth. It was easier to put them in here to show you the type of features, but they saw a lot of aqueous sedimentary rocks, rock that's formed in water, typically mudstone and sulfate. So it's a lot of uh, sedimentary rock, aqueous formed in water. They also found a lot of evidence of small pebbles and gravel. Uh, once again, this picture for clarity is taken off uh, from Earth, but they saw lots of pebbles and gravel there and, and, and Gale Crater. And we all know, you look at that scene, you think, I know one thing that's caused that, flowing water. Here's a quite a cool uh, artist impression, a modeled image of how Gale Crater might have looked in the past. So here's your big crater, here's your sort of a big channel coming in here. Um, there would have been a big delta alluvial fan of, of sedimentary material through here. Here's your um, five and a half kilometer high Mount Sharp. Uh, and here's all the water around it slowly eroding away the um, sedimentary material that's built up over millions of years to form Mount Sharp. So that's quite a cool picture I put in there. That's how the evidence points towards Gale Crater looked a few billion years ago. I'll let you just take that in for a while, it's pretty cool. Okay, so Martian meteorites. Yeah, meteorites come from Mars, and, and you think that sounds a bit strange. No, it's not. You get something like a big asteroid, early days, slamming into the surface of a planet, rocks that's off in the surface gets flung into the air they escape the um the gravity of the planet quietly travel around the solar system uh, you know within the orbit and approach earth's orbit and then they come to us as a meteorite um, they find meteorites from from mars and the moon as well and hell you might say how do they know it's from mars there's a little bit little bubbles in there um and they analyze the the uh, composition of the air inside the little bubbles, and that matches perfectly the composition of the air that they know uh, makes up the atmosphere in Mars, typically from the from those early days from the Viking landers analyzed the atmosphere in Mars quite happily, its composition, and it perfectly matches them. So that's how they tell that these rocks come from Mars. Um, and a lot of the minerals in these meteorites from Mars form in water they only form in water so that's once again another good solid evidence there was water on mars for these minerals to have developed and then it traveled all the way to earth so that's sort of the main lines of evidence in terms of geomorphic views observations from orbit and views and analysis from down on the surface of mars so let's talk briefly about the early atmospheric conditions on Mars and how the sort of uh, its climate history. So the, probably the main questions are, was Mars a cold and dry young planet or could you argue for it being a warm and wet young planet? And if there was for any of this to have happened, there would have been have to have been some atmosphere and water. What happened to the atmosphere? What happened to the water? So let's have a look. So the argument for a cold and dry young Mars, the supporting evidence, it's not hard to imagine, Mars is 50% further out from the sun than Earth. So Earth is sort of yay far out from the sun, 150 um, uh, million kilometers. Earth is another 50% out again, so it's much further out, whereby it only receives 43% of the energy or the flux from the sun compared to that of the earth. Furthermore, three to four billion years ago, when all these processes that we're really interested in right now, the sun was actually 25% less luminous, less bright and less energetic than it is now. It's got a little bit hotter. It's a natural progress of stellar evolution in the main sequence. So it was further away from the sun from earth. Uh, the sun was quieter. Furthermore, um, 
the, the word obliquity refers to it, it refers to a planet's its axial tilt of a planet. Um, Earth is nice and stable, 23.5 percent and um, degrees rather, and that's kept in that relatively stable position because we've got a, a relatively large moon size-wise compared to the size of the um, the planet Earth, so it tends to hold it nice and stable. Mars does not have the luxury of such a high sort of mass, relatively high mass moon. It's just got two tiny ones. Um, and the, the consequences of that, it has, it's got an unstable obliquity or a large variation in the amount of axial tilt. And at periods of high obliquity or high tilt like that, you tend to get a lot of uh, melting of the ice and it moving down, coming down to the equatorial latitudes uh, making the, a sort of a much cooler temperature over the whole planet. And that will cause snow and glaciers to come right down to those low latitudes when you get these periods of high obliquity. And the evidence is that Mars, yep, has gone through some stages of very some unstable and high degrees of axial tilt. Um, so that would allow flowing and standing water Underneath ice sheets, so you'd have ice sheets and glaciers and stuff, but underneath that you'd have some flowing water and some standing water, and that could may well cause erosion on the rock below. So, yeah, that's a that's a viable option. There's some evidence for that or an argument for having been a cold and dry young planet at one stage three or four billion years ago. But there's a problem with that argument. Remember those complex branching valley networks, you know, that were highly branched with those high resolution pictures. And the modeling strongly favors something coming down precipitate rain or snow coming down onto the surface to cause that branching and that, that erosion and runoffs. So that's a problem for the cold and dry young planet argument. So let's then move on for an argument for warm and a wet young planet, knowing that the, it, the, it certainly what supports it is the high branching networking of the that valley network. So, but it's got a problem. If you, to have rain and snow coming down, you've got to have had a warmer, thicker atmosphere required. So that's a problem, but there are some solutions. Volcanic activity, spewing out large amounts of carbon dioxide and water vapor uh, in the early days of Mars. And we know both of those gases are very strong greenhouse effects, which tends to heat the atmosphere up and trap the heat in the atmosphere. Uh, we know there's a numerous, well, I showed you in that earlier picture, there's numerous large volcanoes, and those calderas, you know, evidence of super volcanoes. There's that whole central region of Mars, the um, fastest bulge took up 25% of the surface. So we know there's numerous large volcanoes, there's a lot of volcanic activity, there's widespread lava flows. Look at that whole northern lowland, that new surface, less than 2.8 billion years old. That's lava flow. So yeah, there was a lot on volcanic activity in the early days on Mars. So yep, and they would have spewed out carbon dioxide or water, that would have caused a greenhouse effect, absolutely. Another, poss another thing compounding that or adding to it, um, methane often gets trapped underneath uh, glaciers and with the greenhouse effect, you might get a bit of melting of that or volcanic activity or even some asteroids striking it um, and that releases the methane from underneath the glaciers and that adds to it. In fact, methane is really, really potent greenhouse gas. So you got that going on. And then I mentioned asteroids and comet impacts. Absolutely. So you would have had plenty of those going on. We know that did happen to Mars. It's got the scars of it from the surface in those southern highlands, greater than 3.7 billion years old. They generate a lot of heat when they smack into a surface. And they certainly computer models looking at the size and the number of craters, matching that up with the, the explosions that would have occurred and the impacts. Computer models suggest that, yep, there was plenty of heat. There was enough heat would have been generated to raise the temperature of the atmosphere quite happily. So you've got those three processes quite possibly going on there, most likely going on there. So if there was a warm and a thick atmosphere once on Mars, what happened to it? Um, and if the atmospheric pressure of carbon dioxide and water vapor was high at that stage to cause the greenhouse effect, and then it declined significantly, whereby you no longer got surface liquid water on Mars, how did the atmospheric drop it, pressure drop off? Why did it drop off? And when did it drop off? 
So possible solutions to that would be carbon dioxide might have been incorporated into the rocks as carbonates. That's a possibility. Problem with that, though, is there's the orbiters sort of analysing the rocks for carbonates, and there are no substantial quantities of carbonates detected by the orbits to explain that or to account for it. Uh, the carbon dioxide may have condensed into ice at the poles, and indeed uh, there is carbon dioxide ice at the poles, but those polar caps, as we've talked about, is mostly water ice. Furthermore, the carbon dioxide, almost all, all of it, sublimes into the atmosphere during the spring and summer months on, the, uh, uh, on, on Mars. Um, so a, th a third possible solution is, is the atmosphere or is the atmosphere as a gas lost out into space? And NASA's spacecraft, um, uh, MAVEN, um, is doing research, been over recent years, that's been busy up there researching the atmospheric gases and possible loss into space. And yes, indeed, it confirms this process is ongoing. And that, that's what most likely is our explanation for all of this. So let's talk about how this would have happened. So if the evidence is pointing towards the atmospheric gases just got lost into space, why? It all starts with loss of what we call a glo global magnetosphere. A global magnetosphere responds to, here's a lovely picture here, this is a lovely picture of Earth, and you can see these magnetic field lines going round and round the whole globe of Earth. And that, that's called a global magnetosphere. The reason Earth has got one, because Earth has got a lovely molten hot iron core, which as the Earth spins around, it spins around and sloshes as well. And of course, iron uh, conducts electricity. Uh, I think it's quite complex and I don't know fully how it is, but the principle is you've got something that conducts electricity, it's sloshing and moving and rotating around. It generates magnetic fields and it's strong enough to create a full global magnetosphere. And the, the importance of that for us is that you get these charged, highly energetic charged particles streaming out from the sun in the form of the solar wind. And it's quite habitable. Uh, quite capable of stripping away and ripping in and eroding the atmosphere. But when they hit a magnetic field, they travel down the magnetic field down towards the polar regions of Earth. And that's what creates your um, aura, your aura borealis and your aura australis, your northern and southern lights respectively. It's all these charged particles from the solar wind racing down here um, through these magnetic field lines and then ionizing um, uh, various uh, atoms in the, uh, in the high in the atmosphere. So that's what's going on on Earth. Now, Mars is much smaller than Earth. The diameter of Mars is about half the diameter of Earth. And if something is smaller, its surface area to mass size is much larger. And if something's got a high surface area, it's hot, what's it going to do? It's going to cool down a lot quicker, isn't it? So Mars cooled down a lot quicker. Um, resulting from that, its liquid iron core solidified. It's no longer liquid. Um, so you no longer had this sloshing around, rotating liquid iron core. You no longer had production of a global magnetosphere. So Mars lost its magnetosphere. When, you might ask, the evidence suggests about 4, 4.1 billion years ago is sort of in the evidence looking at the rocks and so on. It's another talk. Um, but yeah, so let's move on from here. No global magnetosphere, as I mentioned, these solar wind charged particles races in, they quietly erode and gnaw away at the atmosphere of a planet whose atmosphere is exposed. Um, Maven, uh, sort of the evidence from Maven suggests at this present day, two kilograms per second of Martian atmosphere has been lost into space. That's pretty amazing. That's a, that's a lot of atmospheric gases, two kilograms per second. So, OK, so that explains most likely the most likely scenario. Let's, so let's bring all this together now with a summary and conclusion. Let's talk about the four main points we've talked about, the likely sequence of events and then the conclusion. So the four main points. One is the geomorphic sort of the large scale features on the surface um, and or, uh, of Mars suggest there's been past surface, surface and subsurface liquid water. You've got those valley networks, those branching out networks in the southern highlands, almost certainly from rainfall between 4.1, 3.7 billion years ago. You've got those much larger, wider, deeper and longer outflow channels, more down in those equatorial sort of central regions of the planet. Uh, things had cooled down a little bit 
Uh, you get these big reservoir, high pressure reservoirs of water. Something triggers it, they get released, and you get suddenly this flooding that heads down uh, downhill towards that sort of low northland, uh, um, lowlands, northern lowlands, creating that northern ocean. Um, you've got a lot of evidence of lakes and deltas and those large craters in the, in the highland regions. And as I mentioned, the, there's quite possibly there was a large northern ocean there, which would explain a lot. Two, rock uh, morphology, how rocks look and the various types of minerals, they all point towards liquid water to form these minerals, suggesting those wet conditions on Mars somewhere between 4.1 and 3 billion years ago over that period. Three, we know there was a, there's a lot of evidence suggests there was a lot of volcanic activity um, on, on Mars. Um, also a lot of impacts, a lot of crater, craters going on, more than capable of providing a thicker and warmer atmosphere. Um, plenty of volcanoes and craters suggesting the process, yet yeah, very prevalent in the past. Four, Mars has cooled down, it was smaller, it cooled down relatively quickly, it's molten iron core solidified, it's no longer able to produce a global, global magnetosphere, and uh, its, its atmosphere is just left open, uh, vulnerable to the, the high energy charged particles of the sun coming in and, and eroding it away, and that's the evidence points towards that's the prime mechanism for loss of the atmospheric carbon dioxide and water in the Martian atmosphere over the recent millions and billions of years, and it's still happening now. So the most likely sequence of events, let's bring all this together. Early on, um, a, lot of, uh, a, a lot of very a warm, dense atmosphere, rich in carbon dioxide and water vapor, provided by the extensive uh, volcanic activity. Uh, that would have all gone on in the first 500 million years. Uh, and then after that, because um, you've got the, the solar system, so Mars is part of the you know, part of the solar system. It's probably about what, five point, sorry, four point five, four point six billion years old. So the first five hundred million years, or half a billion years, you had all that going on. Then from four point one to about three point eight billion years, you've had these large multiple impacts. You know, the the, the late heavy bombardment stage in the solar system um, would have impacted. Um, Re released a lot of methane as well, and then some of that methane then gets trapped in the ice um, and so on. It's a, it's a cycle, but you get a lot of enough heat generated from that going on to give that nice atmosphere. Um, you then had some rainfall was able to to um, water was able to establish itself from the atmosphere. <clears throat> you had rainfall plus or minus some snow and some flowing ice. We're from probably 3.8 to 2.8 billion years ago. The valley networks formed, and then later on, as it cooled down, you had the water flow from the highlands um, and also through the um, through the through the channel out, outlets uh, through to the uh, lakes in the northern ocean about four billion years ago. Um, and I mentioned about four to 4.1 billion years ago, the atmosphere uh, started getting eroded away as Mars lost its magnetosphere. Um, so. The continuous erosion from the solar wind lowered the atmospheric pressure and temperature, uh, which means that it was no longer um, suitable for liquid water. The liquid water started solidifying into ice, into glacier formation, and then went underground. Then you went on to these uh, high-pressure reservoirs that we've talked about um, that then got released as outflow channels. You had these massive big flooding uh, floods of water. That was probably 3.3 to 3 billion years ago. Uh, and then probably from about 2.8 billion years onward, the temperatures uh, and the atmospheric pressure of Mars just continued to drop, drop and drop as the atmosphere just continued to get eroded away. Um, any surface water evaporated and was just lost into space. But the surface water that did manage to survive is remaining um, as groundwater underground as, as ice, as subsurface ice. And of course, some still remains at the polar caps. So what can we conclude? Mars was warm and wet with surface liquid water when? About 3.7 to 4.1 billion years ago. Mars then experienced mixed regional conditions, including ice, so sort of snow, ice, and glaciers. And in the past 2.8 billion years, Mars has been very much cold and dry. And I've just put this here for some food for thought, thinking in a logical manner, 
here's something for you to think about. 3.7 billion years ago, the evidence suggests that life arose on Earth. 3.7 billion years ago, conditions on Mars were far more suitable for life to get underway than they were on Earth. We know that meteors can quite happily travel from Mars to Earth. We've got plenty of them. We also know that it's quite possible that organisms and, and organic molecules can quite happily attach themselves to rocks and meteors. So are we all Martians? We could be Martians. Who knows? We could have originated from Mars. Some days when I turn on the news and see what's going on in the world, I think to myself, that would certainly explain a heck of a lot. So what are you going to do after tonight, later tonight or tomorrow? Yeah, look up on the internet, bring up some images of Mars. I just love it. Just, oh, I just love, look at this image. Enjoy the images of the Martian surface and just spend a few moments reflecting on its past. Um, take in some features. Oh, look, smooth rocks, erosion. There could have been some liquid water there. Look at some of the detail and then reflect on its past. So, gosh, there's no liquid water now. I can see why. Um, you know, what was, the, what was the atmosphere like and why and how it changed? Discuss it with people. So thank you. I hope you've enjoyed Liquid Water on Mars, a story of climate and change. And Steve, I'll just see if there's any questions related to any of that. We do have a couple of questions um, from Robert and Trevor. So Robert asks, on Earth, some extinct volcanoes have sunk and pushed up surrounding atolls. I understand this is a gravitational effect. Do we see this effect from Martian volcanoes? Not that I've been aware of. Um, who was this? Was it? Who said this? Robert or Trevor? This was Robert. 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 I. I. I I'm unaware of it. Um, have a look in the literature, but I'm unaware of the one thing I can say. What What makes Martian volcanoes different to Earth volcanoes, and you've already alluded upon, is the gravity. Um, it's gravity that pulls volcanoes down on Earth, a higher gravity. So there's a, there's a height limit, what you can get. But also we've got tectonic plates, so which means we've got thin, a relatively thin crust on Earth, which can only support a certain weight before something starts to sink down and gravity gets the better of it. As opposed to Mars, is a much lower mass. So there's less gravity, so the mountains can climb a lot higher. And uh, it's a one-plate planet. So there's just one plate, there's no tectonic plates that we're aware of, which means the crust is a lot thicker, so the crust can support these bigger volcanoes. So volcanoes tend not to sink. Um, I'm th also thinking ahead here logically in a logical manner. Um, those big calderas uh, that they found in Arabia Terra, those big depressions, they're huge depressions. Initially they thought they were impact um, craters. And then just recently, it's only been in the last year or two that the spectroscopy from the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter has shown that in actual fact, there's evidence that a lot of that material and, and deposit uh, deposition of material there is actually old volcanic ash pointing towards that whole region was just a region just full of super volcanoes just going non-stop spewing out. Now, why are those calderas so low down versus high up in a volcano? I'm unsure, so that's a little bit something to think about. But I'm, I, I'm totally unaware of any atolls. Um, and I've read quite a bit about the volcanic activity on Mars and the geology, but I'm unaware of any, Robert. So I hope that's just any at least triggered a question about the difference between volcanoes on, on Earth and Mars and the reasons why. Thanks, Chris. Um, so Trevor asks, would the presence of subsurface water be a good case for subsurface living to block radiation when humans eventually make their way to Mars? Yeah. Um, OK, Trevor. Yeah, your best protection against radiation is soil or ground. Water is a marvellous. In fact, there's um, there's even an argument for when they build their uh, spaceships going from Earth to Mars, they have the water tanks around the outside of the spaceship because water absolutely is, is, is great. Um, I suppose if you, if you can go down there in the, t the, the engineering side of it, one of the best, uh, that it's sufficient, however, to build in the side of a mountain or a cliff or something like that. Soil is a wonderful uh, protector against radiation as well. You'd have to have a few metres. And I think engineering-wise, that would be, I'm not an engineer, but just think of it, I would have thought engineering-wise that would have been far more easier to do. And certainly all the... Um, 
uh, NASA's sort of artist impressions of how they would have habitats and stuff, and that have a lot of them in the open, like you see on the the, you know, the Martian movie and that they bases. But they said you'd have to have a something dug into the side of a cliff with a lot of soil over it. So if there's a solar flare coming, all the astronauts get their warning and hop in there and, and hide and hide underneath there. Now water, yes, water is a wonderful protector. But I just question the um, the whole thing of uh, the engineering side of it. But yeah, food for thought. Very, very, very good thought. Yeah. Thanks again, Chris. A uh, couple more, uh, re slightly related to that one from James. Uh, he says, "Where do humans intend to settle on Mars?" So, what's the question? When? Where? Where oh, about? Where? Yeah. Yeah. yeah where the water is, where the water is most accessible. And I'm unaware of any sort of proposed landing sites, but the bottom line is they're going to want to go where the water is, where the water is, but where it's accessible. And it'll be a trade-off. There'll be regions where it'll be perhaps more water over here than over there, but over here is more accessible. Um, perhaps because the subsurface water is, um, is, is a lot shallower and more off it, perhaps more, just more accessible. Um, or, or perhaps by the lakes, um, the subsurface lakes, where you can just pipe water out. Um, but it's it's going to be where the water is, as I mentioned during the talk, for two reasons. One is to 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 um, to drink and 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 also obviously for cooking and stuff and general living, but also to separate into oxygen and, and hydrogen for your uh, for fuel for your spacecrafts. So the bottom line is there where they got the easiest access to the most water they can, and I think it'll be a trade off. In terms of exact sites, I've not seen anyone put their hand up with any exact sites yet. And the final question from Jonathan is, thank you, Chris, for another super interesting talk. Are there any updated images from the, of the first grainy image from Marina 9 in 1971 to show what it was looking at? Yeah, cool, cool. Yes, there is. I actually did a bit of a cleanup of slides for this because I thought it would be quite interesting. I, I actually do, Jonathan. I, I have one just for you, Jonathan. Um, let's, I always put a few outtakes in here. And I, I cull slides out. And I thought it'd be cool to have it in there, and I took it out, but I've actually got it here. Outtakes. So here's your grainy picture, and you might say, what are we looking at here? Because one of the first things that I did when I was putting these slides together, I thought, what are we looking at? I asked that same question of myself. Ta-da! And there it is. It's the um, Nurgle Vallis, um, and it's a sort of a long river. You can see it meandering there, a nice sort of um, river channel. And that is 610 kilometres long. And look, you've got all these sort of channels going on here. Look, you've got a channel inlet to a crater and stuff as well. There could have been a lake here. But really, this was a lovely river in its heyday, about 610 kilometres long. Um, yeah, no, no good, good question. Thank you. So I got managed to show that off. Thank you. Um, OK, any, any others there, Steve? No, that's the last question. So thanks, Chris. Oh. That was super informative and interesting as usual. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Stay safe. And uh, don't forget about your homework. Good night.